Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar is sponsored by an educational grant from Satellite Healthcare, and we thank them for their support. My name is Melanie Paris, and I'm the Senior Director of Health Initiatives and Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speakers, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screen. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on our website, kidneyfund.org slash webinars within the next one to two weeks. As a friendly reminder for those of you who are health professionals, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credits. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. So without further ado, let me introduce today's speakers, Mikey Cook and Eric Smith. Mikey Cook is a social worker with expertise in working with patients with kidney disease. She has more than 15 years of experience working as a renal social worker. She earned her master's degree in social work from California State University, Sacramento, and her bachelor's degree in behavioral science from the University of California, Davis. She currently works as a pathfinder for satellite healthcare. In her role as pathfinder, Mikey provides treatment options education to CKD patients and assists them to navigate their way through their dialysis journey. She facilitates weekly dialysis options education group classes and educates patients on one-on-one. -on -one. She has specialized training in dialysis treatment options and CKD, which enables her to assist patients with the decision-making process. She is compassionate and continues to give hope to patients beginning the path to dialysis. Eric Smith is a pathfinder for satellite healthcare in the greater Sacramento area. His educational background is in exercise physiology. Since college, his professional career has primarily been in the acute inpatient hospital setting. Eric has worked with patients of varying ages with various diseases. He has witnessed and has known many people who have had trouble navigating the changes and challenges of healthcare. He recognizes that when people are sick, stressed, or entering an unfamiliar situation, it can be difficult to listen and follow instructions. One of Eric's greatest joys is helping to remove the barriers that keep people from achieving their best health. Thank you, Mikey and Eric, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having us, Melanie. Thank you. So to all get things started, uh, I'll just welcome everyone and, and welcome from California, uh, sunny California. And it is just after, just wanted to go over a couple of learning outcomes in regards to this webinar, that after this webinar, we hope that anyone who is attending should understand first the importance of goal setting when choosing a dialysis treatment option. Secondly is what is hemodialysis, including hemo, home hemodialysis, and why someone should or would choose this option. And lastly is understanding peritoneal dialysis and why someone should choose this option as a, as a treatment choice for CKD. So before we get started into the nitty gritty of all the facts and details, we're gonna ask for your participation as we begin this webinar. So don't be shy. Uh, these are questions really just for us to get to a better gauge of who our audience is. So the first question that we're going to ask you all is, what's your connection to kidney disease? Uh, first, I have kidney disease. Second, I am a family member or caregiver for someone with kidney disease. Or thirdly, is I work with patients with kidney disease. And we'll give you a, a few seconds to answer that. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap that up and see where, see where we're at, see who we have on the call. A 
Uh, looks like we have quite a few health professionals out there, 84 percent. But welcome, welcome those who, who aren't in the healthcare field. So we're glad that you're a part of the call and look forward to any questions or comments you may have. So the next question is, is if you work for a dialysis company, so if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, if you, if you work for a dialysis company, which company do you work for? Do you work for Fresenius? Number one, do you work for DeVita? And number two, do you work for Satellite? Or do you work for another company that I did not list? That's not listed. So I'll give you a few seconds to answer that. All right, so hopefully it wasn't too difficult of a question, but we'll go ahead and wrap that up and see who we have on the call. Satellite in the blue, Davida in the green, and we have the other. So, well, good to, good to have you all on the, on the call. So thanks, thanks for joining us today. So we'll go on to our next slide. So for those who are not in the healthcare field, if you are a dialysis patient, which treatment do you currently use for end-stage renal disease? Do you use in-center hemodialysis? Do you use home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis? Go ahead and wrap that up and, and see what options are chosen. 83% of our people who are on dialysis do in center. Great. Awesome. We'll look forward to being able to talk a little bit more about home with you. So we'll go ahead and talk about the next one. So if you're a healthcare professional, which I know we have a few on the call, is which dialysis treatment method would you choose? And really with this one, is uh, we're going to select between in-century hemodialysis, home hemodialysis, or peritoneal dialysis. And we just wanted to see if there was a difference in our audience of what people are currently doing in comparison to what people would choose to do for those who maybe work in the dialysis arena healthcare field. All right. Let's see what we have. Survey says. So 56% of our healthcare professionals would choose peritoneal dialysis, 36% would choose home hemodialysis, and 8% would choose in-center. I know I kind of read backwards, so hopefully you can track with me. All right. So that's, that's it for our questions. Thanks so much for your participation, everyone. So really, as we all go to the next slide, is really kicking it off with the importance of goal setting. Is we recognize that sometimes we're caught in the waves of life that beat us down. And, and especially I see for those people that I know Mikey and I work with uh, here through satellite, is there's a lot of uncertainty and, and fear of coming into maybe being a new dialysis patient. But sometimes we just, with those uncertain times, we just don't know which way is the way to go or which way is up. And I, I think of a story kind of back in, Two years ago when I was surfing that caught the wave was going well and, and then the wave got a, had a little bit more strength than I did and so I got thrown off the surfboard and, and it was a pretty strong wave so kind of didn't really know which way to swim to get air and it was a little unnerving at first because it was like wow I, I don't know which way is up because the water all kind of looks the same. So, so I think that um, it's sometimes for, for those who have end-stage renal disease that I think kind of have a similar feeling at times uh, in, in their uh, disease process that they're, they're working with, that they're living with. So, and just as a disclaimer for those who don't live in California, not everyone in California serves. <laughs> so I know sometimes that could be an assumption. So, so I've had the pleasure of doing it, but I don't do it regularly, um, but do enjoy it. So, but really, once, once treatment options are explored, it's important to understand the patient's long-term and short-term goals of what really inspires them. Because inspiration from there, we're really able to see, is it family? Is it work? Is it hobbies? And then from there, we're able to see what, from there, what can motivate, motivate them. So, this goal, goal setting is essential to choosing the right treatment option. 
So what are their long-term and short-term goals? And possibly how will this treatment affect those goals? So again, moving from motivation, again, is those who have played sports or, or done anything in life, uh, whether professionally or personally, that you have to start somewhere. And so there's motivation leads to progress, and even small steps of progress lead to success. So, and really what type of connection you make with people is very important. So we recognize that this may not be true in every single scenario, but most people don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. So, and this is just a fun picture we kind of like to talk about and think of is what type of water source would you like to drink out of? A big hose that's giving you, what do you say, thousands of cc's a minute? Or would you like to be able to control the water volume and how much you drink out of a water faucet? So uh, I, I think I, we give you this image to kind of think of is, and look at it. It's commonly with any type of medical education. We give it to someone all at once in terminology that may be new to them. And we expect them to understand and remember everything that we've told them. So that, that may not be the case. So really steps to starting dialysis or, or any type of change is really getting education. It's becoming aware of what the different treatment options that are available. Then from there, individuals need to decide with their doctor uh, what treatment option would be best for them at their current stage of life. So, and then from there, if, if the, either person's not currently on dialysis, if they're new, or if they're looking to change to a different treatment option, they may need a surgery uh, to prepare them for that. And we'll talk about that in greater detail later in our presentation. And then the healing time for this type of dialysis may take a couple weeks or up to a couple months depending on the surgery, depending on the person's health conditions and, and what type of treatment they've chosen. And then from there, they'll be training with nurses one-on-one -on -one that will be able to, to talk and work with the patients uh, to help make sure that they're confident and competent and being able to do the treatment safely at home or if, if, if they do decide to choose a home option. And lastly, once someone graduates from training, then they'll be in the maintenance phase. So, but it includes control. So I know some of you may be, well, why are we talking about this? Well, great question you have. And as we look at this bar graph here, it's a comparison of the distribution of renal, and for those of you who aren't in the healthcare profession, is uh, kidney, replacement therapy modalities used by ESRD and stage renal disease patients by each country. Peritoneal dialysis is in the blue. Home hemodialysis is in the red. Kidney transplant is in the green. And then in the purple, we have in-centered hemodialysis. So one point that we can highlight from this slide, from this graph, is that in the United States, home dialysis options which include home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis are greatly underutilized in comparison to some of the other countries out there in the world. So, and this data is from the 2017 uh, United States Renal Data System Annual Report. So, uh, quite frequently cited and used resource. And this is another graph and study that was done of Looking at, this is self-reported data from 428 patients from the ESRD Network 18, which Network 18, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is the network is 13 counties of Southern California. That's who they represent, which make up a very diverse population. So you can see the information that was presented to patients about the treatment options for kidney disease. And each one, people had the option of marking whichever treatment option that they were educated on during their treatment option education. And overwhelmingly, Incentra was focused on, but not maybe everything else, was either left out or just not remembered. And, and we recognize that maybe the information was presented, but that it just wasn't remembered. And that really, 
So again, getting back to that, what if someone told me in a different language for the first time information and then assess my understanding after that presentation? It probably wouldn't be very good. It probably looks similar to this graph, just with different uh, information on, on, on the graph. So we'll just be able to see that sometimes it takes multiple times of repetition and ways of learning. There are different learning styles that people have, whether it's visual, audio, or kinesthetic, uh, being able to understand and grasp the concepts that, they, that may be very unknown to them. So the first type of treatment that we'll really focus on, that I'll focus on for the presentation today, is, is peritoneal dialysis. So peritoneal dialysis is the process of filtering your blood using your peritoneal membrane. The, the dialysate solution, which is shown in this picture image, uh, is the blue fluid. And the fluid fills in the empty space in the peritoneal cavity, and the dialysate soaks there, or more clinically, it dwells. It dwells in your peritoneal cavity for a prescribed amount of time. After that amount of time has elapsed, the fluid would then be drained out, which you can see here in the picture, is, is demonstrated by the yellow fluid. So there are different types of peritoneal dialysis, and the first one that I'll talk about is continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, or for short, CAPD. So this treatment is done during the day by hand or manually, and treatments are called exchanges. On average, there are about four exchanges throughout 24 hours, and again, we'll speak on generalities for the purpose of this presentation as we're not making any medical recommendations to anyone that's really up to the doctor and, and just prescribing how much is needed for that for the specific individual. And each exchange when you're actually hooked up to the fluid and doing the exchange is about 30 to 45 minutes. And go, talking about an exchange in our next slide is the exchange is the process of filling the peritoneal cavity hence peritoneal dialysis, with the fluid, which is referred to as dialysate. And then from there, you let the fluid dwell or soak in the peritoneal cavity. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, as, uh, after that time has elapsed, can it be anywhere from two to four hours on average? And then from there, you drain it out and then put new fluid in. So, and it's, Kind of referring back to the old old days of our high, high school biology of diffusion and osmosis. So some of us may have a, a love hate relationship with high school biology, but that's how that's how it works. So, um, but I think a common example that I think of that most people can relate to is if you were to go home and cut up some strawberries and then pour some sugar on them, let it sit there for two or three hours or however long you'd like. Over time, the longer it sits there, that fluid is going to be drawn out of the strawberries. And so that's a similar process with the dialysate fluid. It draws the fluid out of the, the capillaries, the blood vessels in your peritoneal membrane. So, so in talking about the next type of peritoneal dialysis is continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis, or for short, CCPD. Some people also refer to it as automated, automated peritoneal dialysis, APD, automated meaning that you're using a machine. The treatments are done with the machine, usually at night while the patient sleeps. And on average, it's about 8 to 12 hours every day. So these are just a couple of pictures of the different machines that different companies use. So, so depending on which company, for those who are, are patients, or caregivers, depending on which company you're trained at, will dictate what type of machine you would use. But it is very travel friendly and also it's very relatively light. So, so it can range anywhere. I know the newer models are closer to about 18 pounds. Some of our older models are about 25, 30 pounds. So, so it's not a big, huge refrigerator that you're lugging around. As I know back when we had told the audience, we had, had a couple people who are doing in-centric dialysis, and I don't want you to think that you would have a big, huge machine like that in your house. You, you wouldn't. So, but you do have to take into account the storage of supplies. So, so 
we'll talk about training. What does it look like? It's not just until you get the, I mean, it's definitely until you get the hang of it, but some people are like unsure of, well, oh, gosh, I can't do this at home. I've trained professionals taking care of me in the center. How would I be able to do it at home? Well, that's where the nurses work their magic. And so patients train on average for about anywhere from five to 10 training sessions. And each training session is about two to four hours long. So, and there'll be assessments along the way to see what information was absorbed. Ha, 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 fun, funny, funny. Is that, um, that being able to see or what information needs to be gone over again, whether in a different way or, or in a, just described in a different way. And then the nurse and patient will decide together if and when the patient is ready to do peritoneal dialysis at home. So we'll go and talk about the benefits of peritoneal dialysis. And peritoneal dialysis is, out of all the treatment options on dialysis, is the best at preserving remaining or residual kidney function. And I, I know I kind of heard a joke uh, from a patient who had said that pee all that you can pee. And then really those in the dialysis community can maybe get a greater appreciation of that. And so because any, any amount of urine that you can make is really going to benefit you in the long run. But also with peritoneal dialysis, it's a needle-free treatment. Uh, you don't have to put any needles in your body while doing this type of treatment. So we recognize that there might be needles for medication or other things like that, but that is for, for each individual treatment that you're doing, you're not having to put needles in the body. There's also a flexible treatment time when, which could allow you for working or going to school. So the amount of time it has to dwell or soak, the amount of times you have to do it, and the amount of fluid you have to do, those three things are prescribed by the doctor and the nurse. We'll be working with them to critique that, but what time you actually make those exchanges will be dependent on what time you wake up. Some people wake up at four in the morning, some people are maybe still awake at four in the morning, so they sleep until noon. So they wouldn't do that first exchange of the day until that when they wake up in the morning if they were doing it by hand or by man manually. And then also with this type of treatment is you don't need a care partner. You don't need someone to assist you with this type of treatment. So people commonly do this solo, which is, again, for those who live independently or, or have a spouse that's working that is unable to be there while they're on treatment is, is a, a huge motivator. And patients have higher levels of energy than in sensory hemodialysis patients. And also is that, um, that typically have more freedom. When we say eat better, just have more freedom in their dietary choices and less restriction, including more fruits and vegetables. Uh, since peritoneal dialysis is done every day, it is more consistent dial, more constant, consistent dialysis than the typical in sensory hemodialysis. And I i just share a story about one of the patients that I've worked with is that he had been in center for about two years and had challenges with his fluid and, and after his dialysis treatment was a, a common issue that he encountered was he would go home and sleep, sleep for three or four hours, get up and just was really quite tired and, and worn out from the dialysis, in century hemodialysis treatment. And, from there, the conversation was had uh, from, with, between him and the doctor, and, and I was like, is there, are there any other options out there that I can have more energy, that I'm not feeling wiped out, that um, not have my blood pressure deep drop rapidly while I'm on treatment? And that may not be the case for everyone, but for this individual, it was. And so from there, had started peritoneal dialysis, and it's been a, just a, a great story to see and hear of all his travels. We kind of joke and say he's the traveling man because before he really didn't have, I mean, he would go on the weekends to see family in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. But now being on PD, his blood pressure is more regulated. He has no recovery time after treatment. And he's able to travel actually to see his, he has a terminally ill sister in Southern California that he really wasn't able to see. Uh, but I mean, you could tell just from conversations with him just with, she was near and dear on to his heart and just doesn't know how much time he has with her. And so he's, since being on this type of treatment, he's been able to travel more regularly with more freedom 
uh, to see her and to bring her up to Northern California where he lives. And so it's uh, definitely been a, a neat success story where uh, Pryor may not have had as much freedom in regards to, to doing that and seeing her as regularly. So I'll now, so with, I, as much as we share, can share the, the good, I also want to share maybe some of the challenges we face with peritoneal dialysis. Just patients do have to perform their own treatment. So that is sometimes a drawback for some people uh, because being in center, the treatments are done for the individual. Um, but that for some, they do benefit from taking, what do you say, managing their own care and managing their own treatment. They also need to have space to store supplies. So that typical uh, shipments are once a month and, and that can be quite a bit. So we definitely have to have to prepare people to whether it's a spare closet or they have to, there are, uh, I know with one company there is the possibility of having a twice a month shipment. There is an additional fee for that, but if that would allow someone to do treatment at home, most companies do allow uh, for that uh, as an option. And also, is the people who are on peritoneal dialysis must be able to handle issues that may come up during treatment. I mean, they may not have the answers, but there's always someone on call. If there's anything clinical, anything wrong with the exocyte, anything wrong with the dialysis solution or feeling ill or not well, there is a nurse on call 24 hours, seven days a week. But if there's something wrong with the machine, then there's also technical support from the company 24 hours, seven days a week. I will now turn it over to my coworker, Mikey. Take it away. Hi, good morning and good afternoon to those of you um, in the afternoon. So we're going to switch over and talk about in-center hemodialysis, which is also, you know, a great option for many patients. And as we can see from the study and from the poll we took today, a lot of patients in the United States do in-center hemodialysis. So what is it? So in-center hemodialysis is staff-assisted treatments that are performed at a dialysis center. And all of these treatments are performed by trained nurses and certified hemodialysis technicians. Patients are usually given a schedule three times a week on the average usually on a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday, or on a Tuesday, a Thursday, and a Saturday. Some centers do offer extended hour shifts in the evenings after 5 o'clock for working patients, and patients can dialyze at night in some centers on their nocturnal shift, where patients are running anywhere from 6 to 8 hours, about three times a week. Now, the center is the one that usually decides the schedule of when you'll be able to treat. And most patients who dialyze in center dialyze about three or four hours each treatment. So hemodialysis, you might wonder, for those of you who may be um, new to dialysis, what is that? So hemodialysis is the process of filtration of the waste and excess fluid from the blood. Through diffusion and osmosis, as Eric so nicely explained earlier from our biology high school lesson and those strawberries with all that sugar, and the molecules in the water pass from the blood to the dialysate. In order to do this, a patient needs to have an access. A vascular access is the patient's lifeline. The patient can have a fistula, a graft, or a catheter can be used for this procedure to be done. Another thing that's needed is a dialysis machine. And depending on what center you go to or what company you go to, they will have the machines there and the type of machine they use is usually up to the company. And in the pictures below, you can see there's um, a picture of a dialyzer showing the two components, the blood compartment and the dialysate compartment. And you can also see the hollow fibers. The middle picture is an example of a traditional looking dialysis machine. And on the right hand side, you can see a patient who has an access in their arm. So 
So dialyzing in center has a lot of great benefits because we do understand that not all patients are able to do some of the home modalities. The nice thing about in center is the patient shows up, they sit in the chair, and the trained staff does all of the hemodialysis procedures. While you're there, you can sleep, you can watch TV, you can work, and in some centers, you might even get to play some bingo. And the other nice thing is there's lots of patients to talk to, and you have other patients there to share in your dialysis journey. And that reminds me of, you know, I've been working in dialysis. Um, I was a dialysis incident or social worker for about 15 years. So I've seen a lot of dialysis center lobbies. And any dialysis center lobby that you walk into, you might find patients sitting and chatting, and it's like a built-in support group. And so for a lot of patients who may be isolated at home, sometimes they enjoy coming to the center. And I've had a patient tell me once she didn't want to get a kidney transplant because she loved coming to the center with all of her friends and the caretakers that took care of her. She liked for us to talk about the outfits she would wear, and it was just a very special place for her. So in-center definitely has its benefits for patients that need to dialyze in-center. Now, with any treatment, there's always some challenges, and we do understand that if you dialyze in-center, it's not always up to you when you get to dialyze. So there's not as much flexibility with the treatment schedule. You may have to dialyze at 5 a.m. on a Tuesday, a Thursday, or a Saturday, or at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But a lot of centers do offer the ability to get on a waiting list to maybe switch to another schedule if you need to. Another thing is that some patients feel they don't have as much control when they have to dialyze in the center. The nurses, the doctors, the technicians, everybody's in control of what's happening over them in the center. And for some patients, they don't like that. Another thing is there are stricter limits on the food and the fluid for patients who dialyze in center. And that's because of a limited three days per week schedule. So again, those are just a few of the challenges of in center. So now we're moving back into one of our home modalities. So patients can do home hemodialysis. So just like you would go to a center, you can be trained to do hemodialysis at home. Just like Eric spoke about with the peritoneal dialysis, you would have to go through a training program. So patients, patients do train to dialyze at home using machines that are approved for in-home use. And here um, in our area, there are two machines that are most commonly used for in-home use. And on our next slide here, it's showing you pictures of two different machines that you may find most commonly used. The first one on the left-hand side is the Next Stage System 1. That machine is portable and compact. The nice thing about this machine is that it's easy to travel with. You can pack up this little guy and take it with you in your RV, or you can take it on the airplane if you need to. Another option for some patients is the Fresenius 2008K. This is another machine that's designed for in-home use. As you can see, it's much more similar to the machine that's used in the actual dialysis center. And this machine does offer customizable, treat customizable treatments to meet all of your dialysis needs as well. So there's also training requirements for home hemodialysis. So because there's a little bit more involved with home hemodialysis, the training is a little bit longer. The training usually takes about three to six weeks. And the nurses who are training you are going to make sure that you understand all of the concepts before they will send you home to do the procedures by yourself. You'll usually train about five days a week, and each training session can be anywhere from four to six hours each time. And again, this depends on where you train, 
and a schedule can be made, hopefully to fit your training schedule needs. And another important thing to know is that you are being dialyzed during this training. Once a patient is completely trained to do all of these procedures, you'll go home, your supplies, your machine, and everything will be shipped to you. Just like for the peritoneal dialysis, you're going to need some storage to store the shipment of boxes that will be arriving. But once you're home, then you'll return to the center one to two times per month for medical follow-up so that you can meet with your care team to check in and make sure things are going well at home. So there are different types of home hemodialysis. Some patients do short daily hemodialysis at home, which is usually about five to seven days per week for about two and a half to four hours each time. And again, it's up to your nephrologist to decide how much time you need on dialysis. You decide what time of day you'll do these dialysis treatments, and it's a more gentle treatment option for many patients. Patients can also do extended hours home hemodialysis, where they're running about three to six times per week for about eight hours at a time. Patients can dilate at night while they're sleeping. And this treatment is slower, less low rate, and it's a more gentle treatment for patients. Now, looking at some of the benefits of home hemodialysis, the flexibility, that's so important. I know everybody's so busy. And home hemodialysis is there to fit your lifestyle. You get to choose when you want to dialyze. Another benefit is if you don't want to have to drive back and forth to the center three times a week, you can stay home and dialyze right there in your cozy chair, and you don't have to leave. You only have to come back once or twice a month to meet with the care team. Another great benefit is that studies have shown improved heart health and improved blood pressure control for patients who dialyze, um, who do hemodialysis at home. Many patients have also, also said that they felt the recovery time after dialysis was quicker. Some of them felt like after being in center, they were worn out for a day. The patients who do home chemo said, you know, they felt better so much quicker after their treatment was over. So again, those are just a few of the benefits. This slide here is looking at some more of the benefits of home hemodialysis. So those, these two images are showing the difference of the blood urea nitrogen levels in the bloodstream. So the blood urea nitrogen is a waste that forms when your body breaks down protein from food. Our healthy kidneys filter the bun levels out of the blood, and rising levels show that there may be a kidney problem. So when we're looking at these two pictures here, on the picture on the top, you can see that there's more peaks and valleys. And the peaks in the urea in the bloodstream are more severe in the top image. And this is because the patient in this example is dialyzing, let's just say maybe in center three times a week. If you look at the bottom image, you can see that the patient is dialyzing seven days a week, so there's less time to build up the fluid in between the sessions. So all of this is making it less strenuous for the heart and the lungs, so making home chemo a good treatment option for patients. Now, with any treatment, again, there's always some challenges. So one of the challenges is you have to do these treatments at home by yourself or with a care team of family members that's there to support you. Patients can do home chemo solo, or they can do it with um, the support of their family. But the most important thing is you have to be able to do the treatments at home. 
again, there's a need to um, store the supplies because you will get shipments. And as Eric did mention before, you can check with some of the companies to see if you can have your shipments broken down maybe into two if you don't have a lot of space. You have to be able to handle issues that are going to come up during your treatment. But we want you to understand that depending on where you train, most dialysis centers have 24 hours of nursing care support seven days a week so that you are not alone. If you run into trouble at 1 o'clock in the morning, most of these training facilities do have a nurse on call for you to help troubleshoot those issues. And a lot of issues can usually be handled pretty easily over the phone. Otherwise, the care team is available, usually during the week, to help you with issues that may arise. Patients also have to have the ability to use the machine. So who should consider home chemo? People who are working, if you're in school. Some people want privacy. They don't want to be in a center with a lot of other people. If you want control over your health care. If traveling to and from a dialysis center is problematic, this is another great option. And you have to have the ability to perform these tasks. So you have to be able to understand how to use the machine. And you will also be trained to cannulate, to put your own needles in. But a lot of training centers will help you to develop what's called a buttonhole which makes it a little easier for patients to be able to do self-cannulation. Transplant is also a great treatment option for patients. So patients can be evaluated to see if they are good candidates to get a kidney transplant. And although a kidney transplant may be the best option for patients, we do understand that it is not an option for every patient. You can get a deceased donor kidney or a living donor kidney. And we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail about transplant, but we do want you to know that the American Kidney Fund has a lot of great resources. And we've added just a few to this slide. So after the presentation, if you'd like to click on a couple of these links, there are some great resources about adjusting to life after a kidney transplant and what it means to be a kidney donor. So those are some of the great resources that the American Kidney Fund has to offer about transplant. So in summary, we just want to review and make sure that, you know, you understand there are two types of dialysis you can do at home. Eric spoke about peritoneal dialysis and I spoke about the home hemodialysis. And each of these treatments can be done during the day or night. And speaking about the goals and remembering about, you know, what motivates you in goal setting. It's important when you're thinking about which one of these options you want to do to think about how they're going to fit into your lifestyle. Another important thing we talked about was that all of these treatment options have benefits as well as challenges. You know, it's not always going to be easy to dialyze at home, but with all the support that you can get from the center and from your nurses, I trust that you can probably do it if you really have the great support and education and training from the team. And another thing to know is that Studies have shown that these home therapies have offered better health outcomes to patients. So these are just some of the important takeaways. And again, we understand that not all patients can do home therapy, but we want you to start thinking about if this might be a great option for you. And you can reach out to your centers and to your nurses and to your dialysis care technicians and your nephrologists to find out more about these home treatment options and see if it would be a great option for you. And lastly, I was just talking about a couple of resources. Say if you want, did want to find out more, but maybe you don't live in an area or, or have a team that you're, that's working with you that may not be as knowledgeable on certain topics, that you can go to www.satellitehealth.com, that's satellite healthcare 
website, and, and you can also go to the American Kidney Fund website, uh, www.kidneyfund.org. And then a third one is the American Association of Kidney Patients. So there are different forums and meetings that, that are, go on that I think for, for whether it's a, if you're looking at going in center, going in home, uh, would be a, a great option or looking more into that. And out of respect of time for obviously only being able to have you for an hour uh, today, is we wanted to share with you a link to a YouTube video from the American Medical Association that really focuses on health literacy. And so for those of you, it's about a 20 minute video that has doctors and patient interviews uh, displayed and portrayed on in this video, uh, really scenarios, and that if you're a patient listening to us currently, that I think it would really encourage you to not be afraid to ask questions is we recognize that there's a lot of information and if you see a lingo out there that you may not be familiar with and you want to know what's going on. But also for those of you who are healthcare professionals, which is, it seemed like there was a, a good amount of you out there that I think this video would really provide some value to you and making you more aware of what words and information and how you're giving information to patients. So that hopefully we can be better presenters of information in ways that they're able to understand and implement in their treatment. So thank you so much for your time and attention and uh, we'll take uh, any questions. I know that uh, we're going to be, Melanie was going to be taken. If there's any questions that we'll pass it back over to Melanie. Thank you again, Mikey and Eric, for joining us and leading such an excellent webinar. As a reminder, the slides that were used during the presentation today will be posted on our website once the recording is made available. Check back at kidneyfund.org slash webinars for this information to be posted within the week. So at this time, I'd like to ask the two of you to answer a few questions we received over the course of the webinar. So let's see what I have. The first question is, do people have trouble sleeping while doing the extended hours of home dialysis. So some people do, um, depending on what type of dialysis, whether it's peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis. I know that some people, if they're they, if they thrash around, if they're kind of that, <laughs> that, that home hemodialysis or peritoneal, depending on uh, how you sleep, that could definitely affect it. So, um, so, but I know at least some people are a little, a common question that we get is with the machine, does the noise, does the machine make noise? And, and it does, it, it operates, it's on, so it's just going to make noise, but it's, as, as people get used to it, it's more of a white noise, how people describe it, that are on nocturnal dialysis options. So it actually, for some, helps them sleep better because it kind of drowns out the outside noise depending on what type of neighborhood they live in. Okay, thank you. So one question is, are home dialysis options more or less expensive than in-center? So um, it depends on the type of insurance you have. So usually you have the same type of coverage for the home therapies that you have for the in-center therapies. But I always advise patients, you know, check with your insurance before you start on any dialysis treatment option. And there are services at most dialysis centers. There are patient services departments. There may be um, knowledgeable social workers in your center that can help you to look at this if it's a concern. But usually you have coverage for dialysis, whether it be at home or in a center. And okay, so for some you. people to think, in addition to that, one thing to, for people to think about for, uh, from the patient's perspective is if, if you only have one type of insurance, to maybe look at getting a secondary insurance or seeing how that might be affected. Uh, if and when you were to start dialysis, of what would be the primary, what would be the secondary to kind of pick up the, the additional costs that you may occur while on dialysis? So excellent question, though. But as we've, as the healthcare landscape has evolved, if you would say, uh, insurance has definitely become a more complex issue 
And so there's within each insurance company, there are different policies and plans that um, at this current time, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't do it a justice or give you correct information if we told you a number uh, that, of how much it would cost. But we would recommend reaching out to your insurance company just saying that you're exploring the option of home dialysis, whether peritoneal or home hemodialysis, and to see what, what's covered and what would be out of, out of pocket expenses. Okay, so this is related. Um, it's what should I do if my center doesn't offer home dialysis options? So reaching out, I know that there are, you can, whether it's a, a website or, or asking what centers are uh, available, what's the closest home training center, whether it's an independent standalone home training center or whether it's connected to an in-center. I'm aware just whether you would, you could Google home training dialysis centers uh, and online and, or whether you went to, uh, I know a website that I sometimes use is dialysisfinder.com and then you can type in your zip code and from there be able to see which ones offer in center, which ones offer home, not that I'm a, there, there are different resources out there that you can uh, find out and especially if there's not one close by, one of the benefits is after training, you you only would have to go there once or twice a month, typically. And I'd also say another great resource would be to talk to your nephrologist, because your nephrologist may be knowledgeable about a home training center that could be in your area. So that's always a great person to ask as well. Okay. Um, another question is, at what stage of chronic kidney disease should a person start considering dialysis treatment options? Uh, that, if, if only we had the crystal ball, <laughs> if only we had it. Um, it's really make sure, I mean, if you're seeing a general practice physician, uh, if he's referred you to a nephrologist, uh, that being able to, to talk with them and, and just see, because it's for some people, uh, we didn't really go into the details of, of kidney function and the GFR percentages or the creatinine levels, but sometimes people just cruise along at 20% for a couple of years, and and that's great <laughs> for those people. But for some people, they sometimes it might and an analogy is sometimes they can not not in a negative sense, but more of an analogy is they fall off a cliff where they're at 30% and then they dive down into the teens, so um, or they might have to start dialysis sooner than expected. Um, so, so each person is very different, but typically most people start when their GFR is below 15%, um, and so it's really, that, that'll be dependent on the nephrologist and what, what they see and what symptoms. Because they really look at what are your lab values seeing and what are your symptoms, what are your physical symptoms, and looking at both of those. So. Okay, um, so the next one is, are there restrictions for what you can do when doing peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis? For example, eating and drinking, can you do, can you do that? You know, there's definitely going to be restrictions with all types of dialysis therapy. With um, peritoneal dialysis, you're definitely going to have some restrictions with your diet, with your fluid. There's going to be some restrictions as far as lifting. Um, if you're doing home hemodialysis, you definitely are still going to have some restrictions. Um, so it just depends on the type of treatment you're doing, but there are definitely restrictions. Another thing to consider if you're doing peritoneal dialysis and you have a PD catheter, um, you know, Bathing and sitting in pools of water is not recommended. You know, if you're on peritoneal dialysis, lifting more than 25 pounds is usually not, you know, a good option. And, um, yeah, those are some things. So there's some others you want to add? And I think just the biggest overarching theme is the more dialysis you do, the better. And, and so that the more dialysis you receive, the less restrictions typically you'll have because it'll more mimic the functions of your kidney. Because if you think of your kid, for people who don't have kidney disease, your kidneys are functioning 168 hours a week. Well, 
hopefully someone's not on dialysis that long in a week. Um, but but the more dialysis you do, the better. So I think that with that general thought. So in addition to what Mikey said, that's that's only my two cents. Okay, I have time for just one more. Uh, the question is, are there age restrictions choosing um, home dialysis options? Uh, beautiful question. Thank you for asking that. I, that was something I was thinking about the other day that we would definitely like to include on this webinar, so I'm glad you asked. It's very unique that, no, I mean, uh, one of the centers I cover in my region, that there is a patient that is 92 doing home dialysis. I mean, there is some assistance from a family member when they're at home, uh, but it's one of those that typically uh, have to have some cognitive function and not cause harm to yourself. And that's, again, that, that's where the nephrologist and the nurse comes in is making sure that you're a good fit <laughs> during that training process to make sure uh, that don't want to cause more harm than good uh, with going home. Um, so, so, but also, I mean, I've heard of many, I personally have not worked with anyone, but I know many pediatric patients, people who are who are children, who are on whether peritoneal dialysis, typically peritoneal dialysis, not always, um, but but very young, but also very old, um, that um, are on home home dialysis. The biggest thing is how what's the motivation of the individual, and and what are the capabilities and support around them. Yeah, and that you know, reminds me of a story of a patient who had been in center for many years and he didn't like it. His daughter um, decided she wanted to do something to help him, so she decided to become his caregiver full-time and decided to train to help him do home hemodialysis. And he was a much older gentleman, but because of, you know, speaking of that motivation, the daughter was able to be there with him to train with him much older gentleman in his 90s and they've been doing very well on home chemo for a long time but again he had the support and again it's about the motivation factor and you know what you're willing to do and what you're motivated to do well thank you so much um thank you again mikey and eric that was a really great webinar and it looks like we had some really great questions too so just to let everyone know, our next webinar will be held Wednesday, January 24th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Nurse educator Diana Collins will discuss the ways patient-provider communication can be improved and how this affects patients' health long-term. Registration is now available at kidneyfund.org slash webinars where you'll get more information and be able to register. When the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar program the best it can be. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us.